Okay, physics students, we're going to start with our next installment of these videos. This one is going to deal with conservation of momentum. The goal for this video is to first define momentum, and then we're going to move on and talk about what people mean when they say conservation of momentum. But before we get to that, let's go ahead and get the idea of momentum out there. Momentum can be mathematically described with this fairly straightforward equation. The m represents mass. The V is for velocity, and the P is for momentum. You may be asking yourself, why is it that you would use P for momentum? That is a really good question. Moving on, let's take a look at our units. We will continue to measure mass in kilograms, and we will stick with our velocity in meters per second. This gives a rise to the units of momentum, which are kilogram meters per second. Sometimes you will also see people use Newton seconds, a perfectly valid way to talk about momentum. You can recall that since a Newton is a kilogram meter per second squared, when it's being multiplied by the second here, it will give us the same units that are listed to the left. Let's go back for a moment and just look at one other component of this equation. If you recall, velocity is a vector and mass is a scalar. Remember that any time I have a vector operated on by a scalar, it must return another vector. So it's very important to remember that momentum is to a vector. Let's get a feel for what it means to have a lot of momentum. Which has more momentum, a common housefly or the super tanker? The correct answer is we don't actually have enough information. Remembering that momentum is mass times velocity, I need to know something about both the mass of an object and its velocity. Certainly it is much easier for a very massive object to gain a lot of momentum, but it is true that even a common housefly could have a large amount of momentum if it were traveling very fast. Going back to this photo for just a moment and thinking about what does it mean to have a lot of momentum, that word is used fairly well in English in the same way that a physicist would like to use it. Basically, if something has a lot of momentum, then you could almost think of it as having a very particular stubbornness to changing its motion. So it's a little bit different than the concept of inertia because you have to actually have velocity to have momentum. But if you have a lot of mass, you have a lot of velocity, you could bulldoze over something very easily. So let's move on now to explore conservation of momentum. MV, remember, is the momentum. So the momentum before some event is equal to the momentum after some event. This is true for any system. We have to be very careful about this. The system that we're referring to has to be a closed system. Remember, a closed system can only have internal forces acting in it. Let's kick off this idea by looking at two astronauts. You may remember these fellows from a previous video of mine. They got into a little bit of a squabble, pushed each other. As long as I am including both astronauts into the same system, I can say that it is closed. The pushing that they do on each other, that is now internal. I'm also able to get rid of things like friction in this so that I can really truly say that there are no external forces. If we make the assumption that these two astronauts are sitting stationary, which is not the best assumption given that we know something about orbiting objects, we can say that the momentum of the system is equal to zero before any pushing event. After the pushing event, because of conservation of momentum, it must still be true that the system's momentum is equal to zero. Notice that I have to include both of the astronauts again for that to be true. Given that momentum is a vector, I have one vector pointing to the left that's going to cancel the other vector that's pointing to the right. Here I'll just pop up some example numbers for what I mean by that. Also, let's just take note that if I accidentally was looking at the wrong system, let's say just the left astronaut, before the pushing event, the left astronaut, if stationary, had a momentum of zero. And now, after the pushing event, the momentum is negative 100 kilogram meters per second. You can see that momentum was not conserved, but again, I'll point out that's because we were not looking at a closed system. That was a fairly straightforward example of conservation of momentum in one dimension. Of course, we can have conservation of momentum in two dimensions or even three. 
I'll show a very common example of conservation of momentum in two dimensions. We can have billiard balls. I'm showing three of them in this example. We're going to say only the cue ball is moving initially, so it's the only thing that's going to start with any momentum. We're also going to have to say that there's no friction in this entire problem. Otherwise, we've introduced an outside force, and now we would need to reevaluate our closed system approximation. So putting up some numbers, we can see, as I've identified, zero momentum for the three ball and the eight ball, and then we have some momentum, which I'm not going to put a number on, for the cue ball itself. Doing some vector addition for the system, I can say that the total momentum of the system is equal to the individual momentums of the three billiard balls. Of course, the first two were zero, so we have zero plus zero plus this momentum vector in orange is equal to the green one, and I am saying that the green vector is our total system momentum. We are claiming that must be constant, that must be conserved. We will allow for these billiard balls to collide, and I'm going to show what a possible motion might look like. Notice that the cue ball has changed its direction and its momentum, and we've also picked up some momentum vectors on our three ball and the eight ball. Remember, the total system momentum must stay constant, must be conserved. If I were to do some vector addition, we'll take vector P3 momentum from the three ball plus the momentum from the eight ball, plus the momentum from the cue ball, again, that has to equal the overall system momentum which we had before. As a quick note, make sure you understand that I'm not actually showing velocity vectors. Only momentum is conserved. You must always multiply the velocity by the mass of the object to get into momentum space before you start making claims about how momentum will be conserved. Certainly when objects have different masses, like our friendly house fly in this car here, things behave very differently. If I say that both the fly and the car are traveling towards each other at 10 meters per second, that they're going to collide, you could probably predict the outcome. Technically speaking, the car should slow down by a little bit because momentum must be conserved, although you probably wouldn't even notice. I should also say that a real life situation like this can get a little bit tricky because there's a lot of friction at the car's tires and normally we need to get rid of friction at something like that interface so that we can say that we truly have a closed system. Just to prove a point, how would this situation be different if instead of saying that both objects had a similar velocity of 10 meters per second traveling towards each other, what if they both had the same momentum traveling towards each other? Of course, for this to actually be true, we would have to have a situation where the velocity of the car would be substantially less than the velocity of the fly. I've put up some approximate numbers here just to give us a feel for that. Of course, a fly cannot actually travel at a million meters per second. However, our super fly here would cause a very different collision this time. This collision would be very significant from the perspective of the car. If you go back and think about the vectors that I put up, we had another situation where we said the system momentum was zero for the fly plus the car before the collision, so the momentum must be zero after the collision as well. Let's just give our standard brief recap here where we say that momentum P is equal to mass times velocity. Remember that momentum is a vector that is ever so important when dealing with momentum. We can also say that the total momentum of the system must be conserved. This, of course, is only true if you pick the correct system. We need to have a closed system. That means no outside forces. But this can happen in one dimension, two dimension, three dimensions. You can have a simple system like the two astronauts. You can have a complicated system like, for example, a firework on the 4th of July. As that firework goes up, it has a certain momentum associated with it right before the explosion. After the explosion, all the little pieces, parts will fly off in different directions. But if you were to sum up the momentum vectors for all of the parts, they would equal what you had to begin with. I think that's all we have for this particular video. As usual, if you think you understand what was going on, let your computer know.